Hello, and welcome to channel Ein R. Key, and I am your host, Voluntary. I have received a request for a video to cover a particular topic. Not only is it a request, it came from one of my first subscribers. So here go. Please show me one transitional fossil, not just speciation, but an actual body type transition. Voluntary, shouldn't there be thousands and thousands of transitional body type fossils? I have books and books and books and all show only big leaps in body types. Voluntary, what is a true answer? What is a true answer? Well, it is a very in-depth question and there are lots of parts to this answer. Later this video I will discuss a video series that will give some more in-depth answers with more in-depth examples. Link is in the description. I will try to cover the groundwork here. I am actually not the best person for this. I think I'm pretty good but there are some very detailed answers here. And I am a physical scientist, not a life scientist. Therefore, I think the best way I can help with the question is not to give the answer as such, but to lay the groundwork so that the answer can be better understood. It's something I did a lot in my time as a professional tutor. I sometimes tutored subjects on which I knew very little, not often, and I was able to do so because I would, instead of trying to teach the subject, my job was to help others learn the subject. Technically, a tutor just teaches studying habits. The first thing, though, to cover the basics is to explain the difference between a chimera, a hybrid, and a basal form. Chimera. Based off the mythical chimera of legend, it is a beast constructed of parts of other beasts. It had the head, wings, and tail of a dragon, the head and body of a lion, and the head of a goat. Obviously that is completely impossible. For a while after it was initially discovered, people thought the platypus might be one. But it has similar looking features instead of actually having the features described. The famous duck bill is only shaped like a duck's bill. If we ever did find the crocoduck, it would actually disprove evolution. Now, Chimera does have scientific usage. When embryonic cells of different creatures are mashed together in the very early stages, a composite creature can be the result. This actually does happen in nature. It creates a patchwork creature where some of the cells are from one being and some of them are from another being. There are several examples of this. One of them made a parental DNA test very confusing. As the cells used to do the test showed a very unexpected result. It is more common in animals that have litters. It can also be done intentionally. There are goat sheep chimera. In spite of their visible similarities, they are actually in different genera and don't breed. So the way to create a mix of the two is to make a chimera. Chimera are actually not important at all in evolution, except to point out that they are not important in evolution. They do not breed true. If they breed, they breed according to the type which provided the cells that became the reproductive organs. Hybrids. While the most famous example is the mule, this can happen at any level as long as there is sufficient genetic compatibility. A hybrid doesn't need to be two different species. It can be two different breeds of the same species. For instance, if you mix a lab and a poodle, you get a labradoodle. 
The ability to make a hybrid is useful in the study of evolution because it does demonstrate evolutionary relationships. If a hybrid can breed, it doesn't always breed true. Two Labradoodles will produce a new Labradoodle. However, the rare, fertile mules, and they are all female, can only breed back to horses or donkeys. The result will be a horse or a donkey, but a somewhat weird one with some traits or the others. You can't get a mule line because the males are all infertile. The important thing to know is that breeding two creatures doesn't necessarily result in a creature resembling the common ancestor. It is known that dogs are descended from wolves. Then they discovered we can scratch their ears and they could sit on our laps. This funny looking creature is a Chihuahua pug mix. It really doesn't look much like a wolf to the average person. Okay, I shouldn't have called it funny looking. It is adorable. Basils. This is the interesting one. We can deduce that since I've already covered them, the basil is neither a chimera nor a hybrid. A basal form is a simplified, generalized form that can, through simple modifications, evolve in different directions. The basal form of mammals looks very much like a shrew, so much that there exist mammals in different orders called shrews. Now to help illustrate, I've used my crude drawing skills to draw some animals. Okay, as you can see by looking at these crude MS paint animals, one of them has a long tail, one of them has long legs, and one of them has a long neck. If you were to guess, just guess, what would the basal form look like? Well, two out of three have a short tail, two out of three have short legs, and two out of three have a short neck. So the most likely guess is that it had a short tail, short legs, and a short neck. That way, for each of the three branches, only one modification is needed to get from basal to descendant. Now the basil doesn't need to look like that. It could look different, but this is just the educated guess based on what a basal form is. It is the generic form that with fewest modifications can result in the descendant. It is possible that old long neck is the ancestor and two modifications were made to create the other two each. Nature doesn't care about what we expect. Still, if you want to see a common ancestor, then what you want is the basal form, not a hybrid or a chimera. And you need to know what to expect a basal form to look like. Now that you have an understanding of basal form, it is easier to understand what a transitional will look like. Going back to my MS Paint animals, they would have one with a sort of long tail, one with sort of long legs, and one with a sort of long neck. Given that, to look for a major body type transition, you will be looking for something with the very primitive precursors of anything in particular you are looking for. If you are looking, for example, for a new limb, then the transition will have limb buds that are barely developed. So now that leads to your actual question about transitional body type fossils. Well, the bigger the change, the farther back you have to go. As I explained in my video on clades, once you introduce something, it becomes common to all the descendants. Let's look at the very first body type, multicellularity. If a person were to watch Kent Hovind, one would get the idea that he only knows of two microbes, the bacteria and the amoeba. There are many more microbes than just those two. And both of those are very, very large groups. To put it in perspective, it would be like someone saying there are two kinds of animals, mammals and arthropods. 
Neither the amoeba nor the bacteria are the immediate ancestor of the multicellular creatures, and the evidence leads toward the conclusion that multicellularity has evolved more than once. This unicellular creature is called a chronoflagellate. It is a single-celled organism and considered to be the protist that is most closely related to animals. Under certain environmental conditions, the chronoflagellate form a hollow ball, a multicellular structure. Is it true multicellularity, or is it just a clump of single cells working together? The answer is yes, which means that the chronoflagellate ball is the intermediary to the first true multicellular animal, which resemble the blastula that we form early in our development. It turns out that the same thing happens over in the plant kingdom. Single-celled algae, which do exist, are very much like independent plant cells. When a predator, such as an amoeba, starts attacking the single-celled algae, they clump together and form a simple mat of algae cells. But when the predator is removed, they remain at the very early stage of multicellularity. That is by far the biggest body type change of them all. And although they are too small to produce much in the way of fossils, we see them happening right before our eyes, so we know they happen. Each change after that is a smaller change. If you go to Wikipedia and look at the entire taxonomic lineage of the human, it includes many layers. Each of those named levels is actually a place where some change took place and some split took place. However, to get clearly identifiable fossils, you need solid body parts. In arthropoda, you need the exoskeletons. In mollusca, you need the shells. In our lineage, you need the bones. Yes, soft fossils do exist, but it is easier for fossils to form from harder specimens. The next big jump was the development of the notochord. The absolute earliest chordate fossil is the Yunanozoon. The neat thing about this one is some scientists want to classify it as a hemichordate because of how incompletely developed its notochord is. That makes it an example of a transition to chordate. Now I'm not going to go over every example. That is why at this time I will reference the series by Aaron Ra called Systematic Classification of Life. Link is in the description, where he takes us step by step by step from the first life forms all the way down to humans and shows each step in between, sometimes taking tangents but always coming back on track showing the environment at the time as well in very painstaking detail. Now with all of that out of the way, I'll give another example and hopefully we can see how it's a transition to its descendants. When people talk about big changes, they usually think of growing a new limb. That's small compared to achieving multicellularity, but we will cover it. With that, I introduce to you one very famous fossil, Tiktaalik. It is an example of a particular lobe-finned fish. It is also a particularly important example because, unlike other lobe-finned fishes, it has the precursors to what are our wrist bones and to our shoulder bones. It has a somewhat more robust rib cage than fish, necessary if venturing outside of the supportive environment of the water, but it still has fish ribs. 
it also has an actual neck, enabling it to turn its head in a way fish can't, but it was still primarily aquatic, still had gills, still had scales, and so on. It is a mix of various characteristics. That is what makes it transitional. It has features that fish don't have, making it more tetrapod. But it lacks all the features that tetrapods have, making it a fish. And if you want to go all the way back to when I described the basal form, it has basal wrist bones and basal shoulder bones. Since they are basal, they should not look like the fully developed modern wrists and shoulder bones. They should look like extremely simplified versions of wrist and shoulder bones. And they do look like extremely simplified versions. So there, one very dramatic transition with examples, and one visually dramatic transition with an example. There are many more. The field of paleontology is extremely robust, and there is so much to cover there. I only know a tiny portion based on what I have personally investigated. So at this point, I recommend you follow my link to Aaron Raw's excellent video series. Thank you for watching. We're now in the double digits for subscribers, and hopefully we will only keep growing. So please like, share, comment, and subscribe to help my channel grow.